don't worry about it, he said. And his friend looked back surprised and said, oh, I'm sure you don't worry about anything, right? And he said, actually, I don't. He says, how do you work that? He said, well, I hired a professional worrier. He worries about everything for me, so I don't have to do it. His friend said, well, that sounds great. How much does it cost you? He said, it's only $100,000 a year. His friend said, $100,000 a year? How can you afford that? He said, I can't afford that. But I don't have to worry about it. That's his problem. <laughs> now, don't you wish you could afford a professional worrier to take care of all of your concerns. We do worry, don't we? We worry about people. We worry about our kids or our grandkids. We worry about our jobs. We worry about our health. We worry about our future. We worry about our debts. But Jesus says, don't worry about it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, don't worry about it four times. He says, don't worry about food. Don't worry about drink. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your life, Jesus says. And so does Paul in Philippians chapter 4. Paul, of all people, has something to be worried about. As he writes the book to the Philippians, he is in prison on death row. And yet he writes a letter of unmingled joy. Philippians, my favorite book in the New Testament, is a book that mentions joy or rejoice 19 times. And over these last eight weeks, we have looked at joy as a choice. We can have joy even in the mess because joy is our choice. It's not something that we learn. It's not something that we're given. It's something that we choose. We found it in community. We found it in single-mindedness the one thing. We found it in love. There's joy in the pursuit of a worthy goal, that one thing. There's joy in taking calculated risks and living a life that counts. And then we saw over the past two weeks in wholeheartedness. And last week we left off with hope for the future. There is no joy without hope. And there's no hope without Christ, really. Today we will learn that there is no joy with worry and there is no joy without peace. So let me ask you today, are you worried? What are you worried about? If you feel like you need a professional worrier, listen to Paul in Philippians chapter four, as we begin in verse one, the final chapter. And here Paul says, therefore my beloved and long for brethren, my joy, there's the key word, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore, I beg, Euodia, and I implore Syntyche. I remember one person mispronouncing Syntyche as soon touchy. You ever meet someone who is soon touchy? I implore these two women to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Then he says, almost in summary for the whole book, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Always means in the mess. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And then here's the command. Be anxious for nothing. We could put it in the modern vernacular. Don't worry about it. But in everything, here's the replacement, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here is our answer. Here's our solution. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace! Isn't that what we want? Verses 8 and 9, Finally, brethren, 
Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You see, we choose our joy because we choose what we meditate on. We choose what we think about. When we worry, we think about what could go wrong. When we have peace, we choose to trust God. He says, meditate on these things. More than that, verse 9, the things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. We choose what we think about, and we choose what we do. You are what you think about. You are what you do. You choose your life. You choose your joy. And if we listen today, and if we learn, and if we obey, and if we change, and if we meditate on the right things and do the right things, we can make our lives a worry-free zone. You ever drive by a school and they got a gun-free zone sign there? Wouldn't you love for your life to be a worry-free zone? Paul says, Jesus says, your life can be a worry-free zone. How does that sound? How would you like to be able to sleep at night and focus during the day? Paul says you can by choosing peace instead of worry. So how can we do that? Well, he starts in verses 2 and 3 with relationships. And this is one of the things that we worry about, people, right? He says, don't worry about relationships. Be concerned, not worry, be concerned and do something. Concern translates into doing something. So we meet these two women, Euodia and Soon Touchy. And he begs these two women to be of the same mind in the Lord. Why? Because they were fussing. They were feuding. We don't know what they were fighting about. Two women, chances are pretty good they might have been fighting over a man. Or my guess is they were guessing, they were trying to discuss who had the uglier name, Euodia or Syntyche. The key is we don't know what they were fighting about and nobody does and nobody cares because frankly, it's not that important. You ever had an argument and then when you were done, you couldn't even remember what you were arguing about? Paul says it's not that important. Don't worry about it, stop fighting. The key is it was forgotten. Here's what he says. What I want you to do is not worry about the relationship. I want you to do something you two get along, and those of you who aren't Euodia and Syntyche, help them do something. Here, my friends, is the difference between worry and concern. In front of you, I have two objects on the platform you may have noticed. On this side, we have a rocker. A rocker represents for us worry. A lot of motion, a lot of energy, but it doesn't take you anywhere. On this side, we have a bicycle. The bicycle represents concern. God doesn't want us to worry, but he does want us to be concerned. And here's the difference. When you take the energy that you put into rocking and you put it into pedaling the pedals, it moves you and it gets you somewhere. The rocker leaves you exhausted but going nowhere but the bike takes you someplace. Worry is a sin. It's a lack of trust in God. It spends a lot of energy and time, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Concern does. God doesn't want you to be, he wants you to be careless, but he doesn't want you to not be concerned. When Jesus says, don't worry about food, he doesn't mean don't be concerned about it. You need to be concerned about it because without it, you'll die. You do need to be concerned about water. You do need to be concerned about clothing and about housing. But what does concern do? It gets on the bike and it starts working towards, it starts to do something. Worry doesn't do anything. But concern is God's motivation to get us moving. And so concern leads us to action. Worry leads us to passivity, inaction. 
And so God wants us to get off of the rocking chair and to get on the bike and do something about what we are concerned about. I want you to think for a moment about worry. Worry ruins my health, it robs my joy, but at least it solves nothing. But there is no redeeming value in worry. Worry accomplishes nothing. It is a colossal waste of time. In Matthew chapter 6, right after talking about worrying about food and clothing and the birds of the air, he says, which of you can add one inch to your height by worrying? You can worry about how short or how tall you are, but it doesn't make you taller or shorter, does it? No. Does it change anything to worry? Of course not. But if you're concerned and you do something, now you can't do anything about your height. You might be able to do a little bit of something about your weight, but some things you can't change. And Jesus is saying, if you can't change it, why worry about it? And if you can change it, why worry about it? How about be concerned and do something about it? So what can I do? Uodi and Syntyche can get together and apologize, make things right, reconcile. The others can help them. And so first he wants us to recognize that worry solves nothing. Ruins my health, robs my joy, solves nothing, and really wastes my life. Second, B, here's how we do that. We transform our passive worry, the rocking chair, and we transform it into active concern, the bicycle. We make it right. If there is a fight, then we reconcile. We make things right. If there's someone else that needs help, we help them. If you have people problems, and if you are alive, you probably have people problems. You can worry about it, or you can do something about it. Doing is always better than stewing. You ever spend all day stewing and nothing gets better? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you come to the altar and there you remember that someone has something against you, do something about it. Go, get on the bike, go to them and make it right. So what are we supposed to do? You do something, you get it right, you make it right. That's what he's telling you, Odie and Syntyche, to do and everyone else in the church. Whatever you are doing, stop. If it's issues of anger, of fussing, then apologize, forgive, tell someone you love them. You see, here is again another incident of the replacement principle. He doesn't just say stop worrying. He says start being concerned. Start doing something. Worrying never changed anything. Concern can change things. Here is the replacement principle. Rather than worry about things that they should be doing and they don't do, how about if we concentrate on the things that I can and I should do, but I haven't? I can worry all day about what they should do, or I can be concerned and do what I should do. You see, doing is therapy in and of itself. Worry just turns inward and turns into ulcers. But concern turns into action, and action is release, and it's action, it's change. It is the best kind of therapy. And then, notice in verses 4 and 5, the how. How can I transform passive worry into active concern? He says, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Twice he says rejoice, but notice that phrase, rejoice in the Lord. Not in yourself, not in where you are, not in your savings, not in your job. Rejoice in the Lord. Remember I said it's joy in the mess. Wherever you are, it is joy here and now. It is not joy in what's going on below. It's joy in what's going on above you in heaven. This is joy in the mess because specifically in relationships, I can rejoice in the Lord. Notice verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men the Lord is at hand. I want to trust my concerns to God's presence. Okay, I've got a problem with somebody else. And they've got a problem with me. Well, I also trust in a person named God. And so I want to trust those issues 
to God's presence. Is God here? Yes, that's what it says in verse 5. The Lord is at hand. Sometimes this is misread as a second coming passage. This is 2,000 years ago. The Lord was at hand then and he's at hand now. And if he doesn't come for another 10,000 years, he's at hand now because the Lord is present. It's not saying here, you better be good because Jesus might come back at any minute. He might. But you better be good and treat each other well because the Lord is at hand right now. He's in the room. So here's Paul's advice to us. Treat your brother or sister as if your father was in the room. Because he is, isn't he? God sees how I treat you. God sees how you treat me. Remember when you were small, did you have a sibling, a brother or sister? If you had a brother or sister, I guarantee you had disagreements, right? You had struggles. Did you treat your brother or sister perfectly? Probably not. But didn't you treat them pretty well when mom and dad were in the room? Well, how should we treat each other when Jesus is in the room? Here's what Paul's saying. Euodia, Syntyche, Jesus is in the room. Philippians, Jesus is in the room. Don't just worry about it. Do something about it. Trust it to God. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. And so if we let our gentleness be known to all men, he is saying, treat each other differently. Let people see that you love one another. Remember, that's how they'll know we're Christians. By the way, we love each other. And why do we love each other? Because we're brothers and sisters, and our Father is always in the room. This week, as I was studying for this very message, I had a concern. I was tempted to worry. But then God said, uh, practice what you preach. So I put aside my studies, and I picked up the phone, and I made a phone call. That's getting off the rocking chair and getting on the bike and doing something about what you're concerned about. So what Paul is saying is, if you've got some concerns about other people, that's great. What can I do about it? If I can't do anything about it, then I need to trust God. But here's the priorities. Turn worry into concern. Concern is turning it into action. What can I do? I need to do what I can do. To say I'm going to trust God and not do anything is presumption. But for me to do what I can and then trust God, that's progress. And so I want to trust God, but I want to do what I can do. Okay, so I'm going to trust my concerns about people, relationships. I'm going to trust them to God's presence. What about the rest of my life? If half of our worries are about people, the other half are probably about things and the future, responsibilities. We worry about what might happen. So let me give you a very accurate worry chart. The worry chart proves that worry run, ruins our health, robs us of joy, solves nothing, and wastes our life. If we think about it, 40% of what we worry about will never happen. That's being conservative, right? At least half of what we worry about won't happen. But let's keep it down, be very concerned. 40% of the stuff we worry about will never happen. So why should we worry about it? Well, 30% at least may have already happened. It's in the past. Why worry about the past? We can't change the past. And then this chart put together by experts said we worry about needless things like health, things that we can deal with. Well, if you're worried about your health, do something. Go to the doctor, take your, take your medication, take your vitamins, do some exercise, diet a little bit. Some things we worry about when we could be doing something about them. Then there's 10% which are petty issues, things that are so small we don't need to worry about them because it doesn't make a difference whether it happens or not. If we actually start to name what we're concerned about, worry goes away, and we can decide, well, that's not worth worrying about. That leaves us 8% for things that we can't do anything about. Half of the things that actually are of concern are things that we can't do anything about. So why worry about it? 
And the last 4% are things that we can do something about. So why worry about it? When I was a kid, there was a baseball player named Mickey Rivers. He played for the Yankees, right? Mickey Rivers said, and I'll never forget it, he said, ain't no use worrying, because if you can do something about it, why worry? And if you can't do nothing about it, why worry? Well, isn't that what Jesus is telling us? Isn't that what Paul's telling us? I just like the way Mickey Rivers put it. Ain't no use worrying, because it all breaks down into one of two categories. You can do something about it, so stop worrying and do something about it. Or you can't do nothing about it, so stop worrying about it and trust God. So now Paul gives us the second point. Paul says, don't worry about responsibilities. No, be concerned. Do something about them and trust them to God's peace. We want to trust relationships to God's presence. We want to trust responsibilities to God's peace. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing. That is a command, isn't it? That's one of the commands that ought to be in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not worry. It is a sin, isn't it? We recognize that if it is a command, then worry is a sin against God. Here's why we don't want to worry. Worry is a sin against God. It is a declaration that God is not big enough or loving enough to take care of me. You ever thought about how bad worry is? I know this is a socially acceptable sin. This is one of the sins that we're not ashamed of. Nobody goes to a prayer meeting and says, pray for me, I'm having problems with lust, I'm having problems with stealing. No, we don't, but we go to prayer meetings, we say, pray for me, I'm really worried about my children, I'm really worried about my, this test coming up, and we almost brag on the sin of worry. When it is a declaration of independence from God, he's not big enough, he's not loving enough to take care of me. We treat it as a cute little sin, but it is not. It is damaging. It is destructive. It is the rocking chair that doesn't just give us relaxation. It damages us. So what God wants us to do, what Paul wants us to do, is to translate that worry, a sin, into action. God says, do you trust me? If you trust me, then why are you worried? You can trust God and be concerned about where the next meal's gonna come from, how you're gonna pay about that bill. But worry doesn't help you pay a bill. Concern does. Maybe I need to get a second job. Maybe I need to do something. So, worry is a sin. B, transform that passive, sinful worry into active concern. Pray and do. What does he say? If you are anxious, no, you need to do something about it, pray. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And it's not just pray, but it's do something. These things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Notice the first thing to do is to pray. Turn it over to God. Second thing to do is to do something. Maybe be the answer to your own prayer. God drop something from heaven for me, or maybe I should go out and do something about it. Active concern is doing something about it. I want you to notice in verse seven, he says, if you pray, then the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Wouldn't you love to have the peace, not just peace, but the peace of God? When you pray, you get the peace of God which passes understanding. But notice when you do in verse 9, if you do something, then you have not the peace of God, you have the God of peace. Wow, there's a one-two punch. I've got the peace of God, but I've got the God of peace, the maker of the universe. Why am I worried? This is what we need. Worried? Well, then confess that sin to God and then, second, transform it by the replacement principle into concern. Concern is getting up out of the rocking chair, getting on the bike and doing something, going somewhere, changing things. Maybe it's confessing the sin, maybe it's repenting, but it certainly is doing something. And then see, 
I choose my life because I choose my attitude, because I choose what I think about. That's what Paul gives us last here. He says, this is what I want you to think about. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, meditate on these things. Why are you wasting time in the Bible telling us what to think about? Isn't it just what we do? No, what we do is what we thought about first. What we think about, we do. What we do, we become. And so he says it's very important what you think about. Think on what's the very first thing he tells us to think about. Whatever things are true. What is worry? It's thinking about things that aren't true, right? It's thinking about things that might happen, could happen, but haven't happened. They're not true. But if you think about what is true, there is a God, and he's my father, and he cares for me, then you can have the peace of God. I choose my life because I choose my attitude, because I choose what I think about, what I look at. Here's an old proverb that I wrote in the back of my Bible. If you sow a thought, you reap an action. And if you sow an action, you reap a habit. And if you sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. And if you sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. What you think about, you do. And what you do, you become. So you get to choose. Will you be worried the rest of your life? Or will you be concerned and change your life? Get off of the rocking chair, get onto the bike, and change your life. The question is, do we trust God? Worry says, I don't trust God. I've got to worry about it. God hasn't got it. Here's a very simple flow chart, kind of way of putting Mickey Rivers' statement onto a piece of paper. Do you have problems in life, top left? Of course you do. People problems, future problems, responsibility problems. We all have problems. Did Paul have problems? Sure he did. There's only two answers to that question, yes or no. So if the answer is yes, follow the flow chart down. Do you have a problem in life? Well, let's go to no first. Go across the top. Do you have a problem in life? No. Well. For a moment, you don't have any problems. Great, then why are you worried? But if the problem is yes, for most of us, most of the time it's yes, then the second question is, can I do something about it? And if the answer is yes, I can do something about it, then why worry about it? Do something about it. And if the answer is no, then why worry about it? Because what is worry going to accomplish? Nothing. So there's only one way to answer the first question, yes or no. And there's only one way to answer the second question, yes or no. And in every single case, it re leads to the exact same conclusion. Why worry about it? Paul says, why worry when you can pray? But you know what we say? Why pray when I can worry? Why would we want to worry? It doesn't do us any good. But oftentimes our lives say, oh, okay, when I'm desperate, then I'll pray, rather than praying first. Friends, today, let's all of us make our lives a worry-free zone. You don't need a professional worrier. You've got God. If we get off the rocking chair and we get on the bike, if we transform our worries into concern, take worry out of your vocabulary. You're a child of God. You don't need to worry. Should you be concerned? Sure. But do something about it. Pray and then trust God. So worry solves nothing. Concern does. It does what it can, but then takes the rest and trusts God. Not just a professional warrior, but the God of the universe who says, I've got it. When God says, I've got it, who are we to say, I'm not so sure? 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Here's what we do. We cast them on him, 
and then we go back and we get them. Okay, God, thanks. Thanks for borrowing my problems. Now let me have it back so I can worry about it some more. Why? Cast your care upon him, for he cares for you. We started our service this morning in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus said, don't worry about food, don't worry about clothing, don't worry about your life, don't worry about tomorrow. Then he ends the chapter, Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, food, clothing, all that stuff, all these things will be added to you. God will take care of it. You can take care of part of it. What you can't, God will take care of. But trust me, God says, I've got it. Matthew 6, seek ye first, is the deal of a lifetime. Here's God's deal. He says, I've got some concerns. My concern is the kingdom of God. I want you to be concerned about what I'm concerned about, reaching eternal souls for whom Christ died, helping them to know Jesus. If you will seek first what I seek first, I'll trade you concerns. I don't want you worried about anything, but I know you're concerned about things. So here's the deal. You be concerned with my concerns, and I'll take care of your concerns. Is that worth $100,000 a year? What if God were taking care of all of your concerns? Wouldn't that be great? Isn't that what Jesus promises? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'll take care of the rest. Many times in Hollywood, the same thing happens. The hero reaches out and says, here, take my hand. Do you trust me? And so Aladdin says, or Indiana Jones says, do you trust me? Well, Aladdin or Indiana Jones might drop you. But God will not. He says, I've got it. Do you trust me? Every time we worry, we say, God, I don't trust you. God, make my life a worry-free zone where I trust the God of the universe who's got it. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for being the God of the universe, not just all powerful, but all loving. And Lord, forgive us for the sin of worry. Lord, I pray that this week our lives would be worry-free zones as we turn over our worries, transform them into concerns, transform them into action. Lord, if there's someone here worried about their eternity, Lord, I pray that today a real true concern about what happens after this would translate into action placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ before it's too late. Lord, I pray that today, if there's someone who does not know you as Savior, today they would be concerned enough to do something about it. This is the day of salvation. Lord, help them to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, if you're here this morning and that's your situation, I'd love to pray for you. Would you pray right now, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I deserve death and hell for my sin against you, but I thank you for loving me anyway and dying on the cross for my sins. The best way I know how, I ask you to save me for Jesus' sake. I place my faith and trust in you. I know you've got it. If your head's still bad, if you prayed that prayer this morning, God has got it. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and you meant it, I'd love to pray for you. Would you allow me that precious privilege? Check off the first box on the bottom of your attendance sheet there. Put it in the offering plate. Hand it to me. It says, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today for the first time I meant it. If you didn't and you need to, would you settle it today? If you are God's child, your Father loves you. He wants you to be concerned. He wants you to do what you can, but he wants you to trust him for the rest. Right now, as his child, would you ask his forgiveness for those things that you've taken back and worried about and just trust him. Lord, we know you are good. We know all things aren't good, but we know you can work all things together for good. And so, Lord, we trust you. We cast our care upon you. Lord, make a difference in us and then make a difference through us. For in Christ's name we pray.
We're going to stand together and sing a great 